Harvard professor Tony Seish, a most renowned uh, China scholar, director of the Ash Center. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. From rebel to ruler, this is a brand new book that's、uh, coming onto the market on 100 years of the Chinese Communist Party. By Professor Tony Seish, and indeed, this is not just a historical illustration of the hundred years of the Chinese Communist Party, but rather it is a illumination on one of the greatest global phenomena of the large part of the twentieth century and the twenty-first. Tony, in chapter one, you started the whole book by stating that thirteen Chinese young men met in the French concession of Shanghai in nineteen twenty-one. And then developed、uh, subsequently one of the、uh, greatest economic transformation and I should say political transformation as well of modern China. So, what do you think these thirteen people had within their power and capacity that made them so enormously successful? Well, the thirteen were not successful. I mean, that's the most important thing, really related to that. I mean, they were young men, no women, at that particular meeting, who were severely disillusioned、uh, by the inheritance in the past. We'd had the collapse of the last dynasty,、uh, but it hadn't ushered in a new effective politics. War, warlordism was reigning, and there was a maelstrom of different ideas、uh, racing their way around China.、Uh, anarchism was more、uh, popular at that time、uh, than Marxism. Social democracy was popular. Liberalism, through Dewey and others, who sure in his ideas was was gaining ground. And you know, the thirteen who came together in Shanghai. Remember, only two of them stuck with the Chinese Communist Party all the way through to 1949. One of them, of course, being Mao Zedong, and the others went off in all kinds of different directions. Their initial proclamation was really.、Um, High in the sky hopes they were going to introduce the dictatorship of the proletariat. There was really no proletariat in China at the time.、Uh, they despised the yellow intellectual class. Yet all of them themselves were intellectuals that had come out of study groups. So it was really aspirational. And there was only fifty-three members, I think, at the time. So it was aspirational. So it's not really that that kind of explains what really brought them to power in 1949. And that that story really. Lies elsewhere. It was an important start because they did form the party, which、uh, continues through to this day. But、um, that first party congress was actually,、um, unlike what seems to be the case nowadays,、uh, open to very wide-ranging arguments and debates and dramatically different views about how China should move forward. Very interestingly, Tony, you mentioned well. There are other reasons that brought power eventually to the Chinese Communist Party. The Nationalist Party over that period of time were better equipped militarily, and they got certainly the American support. So, what made the Communist Party defeat the Nationalist Party and eventually embrace this power? Well, I think there's two different aspects for the explanation of that. I mean, one relates to the failures of the Nationalist Party itself. Um, you know, we all know that one of the common jokes about Jiang Kai-shek was "cash my check." I mean, because they were seen as very corrupt. They also, I mean, even though they adopted the discipline, the idea of a Leninist party, they never really had the discipline of a Leninist party. And Jiang Kai-shek was having to weave together really、um, very disparate forces,、uh, which often didn't follow. His wishes or his policies, so that you know created a whole set of、uh, problems. And yes, there was an American support there, but the Americans were always very concerned about the nationalist movement itself. So there were weaknesses within the Nationalist Party. They probably could have overcome those if it hadn't been for the Japanese invasion. And I think you know one can't underestimate the ways in which that weakened. The nationalist、uh, movement as a force,、um, you know, many of its、uh, best equipped fighting forces engaged with the the Japanese, so they came out of the Japanese war not defeated but severely weakened when they had to take on the challenge of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> 
But then the other arguments really relate to the Chinese Communist Party itself. Um, it gained a reputation as being more honest, more pure than the nationalists. Um, it also, even though it uh, put itself forward as a, an opponent uh, of the Japanese invasion, it really didn't engage very significantly with the Japanese. It kept a lot of its best troops well protected uh, and didn't uh, lose many of them in fights against the Japanese. But then most importantly, I think, uh, under Mao Zedong's leadership, it really turned itself into a very organized, disciplined party that really could act with the unity in the way that Chiang Kai-shek could not. And that made it well equipped when it came to the period of the Civil War at that time. And then um, um, stupidity, mistakes, faults come into play. Mm -hmm. uh, most people who studied that period in depth really would say that uh, Chiang Kai-shek made a number of crucial mistakes in the way that he committed his forces in the battles in northeast China. And once he made those mistakes, he really had lost the most uh, important and decisive of his troops who might have been able to resist uh, the communist forces. And I think then success, you know, breeds further success. The, um, under Lin Biao's leadership and others, uh, China started winning numerous victories uh, in the Northeast. People sort of fell in behind that. Uh, many of the nationalist troops were turned over to be communist uh, party troops. And it began to just push further and further south as the uh, nationalists in many ways began to implode. So I think it's a variety of factors that came together that ultimately explain it. Soviet help, of course, was important. Wavering US support, I think, to the nationalists was important. Um, but the party itself um, acted strategically, incisively, and very smartly in the Civil War. Mm. In 1972, when Nixon visited China, uh, within a couple of hours, he was invited by Mao to have this private conversation. And Mao said, I voted for you. And I love writers. <laughs> Do you think Mao is an opportunist? How would you comment Mao? Well, he was opportune in seizing uh, on that possibility. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say he was an opportunist in the sense that he had no moral core or principle. I mean, if he didn't have a moral core or principle, it's hard to think that he would have launched the great, the uh, Cultural Revolution based on his idea of classes, revisionism, and that China was going back down a capitalist road. No, I think in terms of that question of opening to the United States, which is still seen as one of the major achievements of the Cultural Revolution period, even if other parts are criticized, I think it really was his assessment that the tides of history were shifting, that because of his own confrontations and conflicts with Soviet Russia, the Soviet Union really presented a greater threat to China and global peace than the United States of America. And while he didn't love either of them, I think he thought that uh, an opening to the United States of America, and remember, it wasn't seen then as an economic ploy. It was really seen as a, a strategic question, one related to international affairs and geopolitics, rather than one uh, which we often think about now in the relationship, that it was an opening of China to the world and the economy and foreign engagement uh, in the commercial sense. Mm. Deng Xiaoping, Tony, do you think he's a Marxist? Had Deng Xiaoping lived longer till today, hypothetically, where would he like to take China, you think? Well, I think it was pretty clear from the beginning that um, he was influenced by Marxism, by both what he'd seen when he worked in France, but also through his readings and his understandings of it. So I think that does run through. He believed in the primacy of the party, that only the party really could push things forward. And that even when the party had made mistakes, such as the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, you know, they were able to correct those. And he certainly saw no future for China without a strong communist party. 
I think all of that is uh, quite clearly the case. Having said that, I think his significant difference with Mao, and this, of course, is reflected in the saying about black cats and white cats, and as long mm. as they catch the mice, they're a good cat, that in many ways to him, the means were import as important as the end you were trying to get to. Whereas for Mao, the means were also a problem if they reintroduced uh, elements of capitalism that might lead to some kind of bourgeois restoration. I don't think any of that bothered uh, Deng particularly. One thing he does seem to share with uh, Mao is the idea that eh, the faster the better. I mean, you continually see people like Chun Yun and other leaders trying to hold him back. You know, no, you, that level of growth is going to be destabilizing. And Deng just kind of plowing on through. So what was the end for him? I, I think the end was really where those Chinese intellectuals were looking towards back in the 19-teens. They wanted a China of wealth and power. And um, that's what Deng Xiaoping wanted to achieve, a China that would have wealth, that would have power, would be treated seriously on the global stage. And whether you call that Marxist or not was probably secondary. Mm. So how is that Deng's vision, had he continued to live on, different from the current Chinese leader's vision? I'm not so sure it would be dramatically different, to be honest. Um, um, you know, there might have been some variation um, around the edges. But I think if he looked at things, I would have thought he'd be quite impressed with where China is now. You remember when he talked to foreigners such as Margaret Thatcher over the question of Hong Kong, he was pretty straight and pretty direct. You know, when he met with uh, Bush's emissaries after 1989, he wasn't contrite for what happened. He basically told them, it's your fault. You know, you've been introducing all these awful ideas into China. It's your fault. There were these demonstrations in 1989 that I had to act to put down. So he was tough on that. And I think, you know, the well-known phrase of his, of, you know, biding your time and not showing your strength too early, I think that was strategic. And I'm sure, you know, when he needed to, the invasion of Vietnam, for example, <laughs> he was quite willing uh, to use China's strength to get his point over. And I suspect, uh, given China's power and strength at the moment, he might well appreciate the tougher stance uh, coming from Beijing in terms of protecting and promoting its interests uh, globally. Mm. The current Chinese leader, Xi Jinping, a lot of people say that he's uh, uh, politically leaning more towards the Maoist policies. And certainly uh, there's been a lot of gestures about uh, the rectification of the understanding of the Cultural Revolution, etc. in recent months. Do you agree with that? Yes and no. I mean, I think for his own legitimacy, he wants to trace an unbroken line, both through Chinese history, the 2,000, 5,000, however many years you want to define that as, as representing the best traditions uh, of the Chinese culture. I hear he's very interested in the Yongzheng Emperor, so he clearly sort of knows his history. And of course, that emperor was a pretty fierce, tough uh, dealer. So I think he probably likes that. But I think for his own legitimacy, he wants to trace the second line and that is more of an unbroken history of the Chinese Communist Party's rule. And that becomes difficult when you admit and acknowledge uh, too strongly uh, the anti-rightist movement, the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. So I think that's why we're seeing in the current history campaigns a sort of a blurring of that. So the people can't use what he calls historical nihilism to attack the Communist Party today uh, by showing that, well, yeah, things went wrong, but they were experiments. And we learned from those experiments. And it's, uh, you know, it, it is one history which takes us all the way for, through from 1949 to the present. Now, he's not really Maoist in the sense that he's not engaging domestically in class struggle, for example. 
He is hard on dissidents. Uh, that is definitely true. He believes in the power of the party like uh, Mao did. In some ways, I see him as more akin to Liu Shaoqi, who Mao, of course, got rid of in the Cultural Revolution, was the number two and president of China, in the sense that Liu Shaoqi's views were that a well-functioning unified disciplined party would take China forward in a positive way and would help the party meet its goals. And of course, you know, he wrote the very famous piece, How to Be a Good Communist Party Member, Xiaoyang and so on and so forth, which in many ways is almost a Confucian tract for a Communist Party member. And so I think, you know, for Xi Jinping, I think the sort of traces and elements of both Mao and someone like Liu uh, in uh, the way he approaches the politics and deals with it. Do you think Xi Jinping actually subtly follows the legacy of his father as well? Because a lot of people question why well, your father was actually punished during the Cultural Revolution, and yet this uh, uh, endorsement, in a way, of the Cultural Revolution sounds perplexing. Yes, it is perplexing. And there's a lot of things about Xi, uh, Xi Jinping's past which are perplexing. Um, I think, you know, the fact that he had been in Zhejiang and... Uh, coastal provinces and seem to uh, encourage and interact with the private sector there. Uh, and, you know, his father, of course, who seems more liberal, who drove a lot of those reforms in the south of China, in Guangdong and so forth, and the fact that he'd been persecuted uh, for his ideas uh, in the Cultural Revolution, that he'd also been critical, it seems, uh, of Deng Xiaoping for his more autocratic tendencies that I think many people inside China and outside thought that we would be dealing with a much more liberal uh, leader. Not, not a leader who was you know, going to give up the Communist Party, but you know, might be more open, um, might ease China towards uh, more uh, intellectual freedoms, perhaps. And I think you know, we were clearly very wrong about that. Um, so it is perplexing. I mean, he's clearly, despite the November 2013 uh, communique, which seemed to suggest uh, a greater role for the market uh, in the economy, he's clearly come down in terms of a preference for the state-owned sector domestically and uh, internationally. He's been much tougher on dissent than uh, some of his predecessors. Um, and so I think he re genuinely believes that unless there is a tight, unified, disciplined party, things could go uh, badly wrong again. Mm -hmm. So I think he's taken a lot of people by surprise in that sense. Mm -hmm. Tony, socialism was Chinese characteristics. I think many people around the world just use the words like capitalism and socialism uh, as uh, taken for granted. What is really socialism? What, socialism in China or socialism generally? Socialism in China. Well, socialism in China is whatever the Communist Party says it is. I mean, there's <laughs> not much debate about that. I mean, it's, uh, and it's evolved over time. I mean, the Chinese characteristics is the important part of it, that, uh, um, that uh, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, greater engagement with the market, whether it is more state control, uh, all of that is under the rubric of socialism and Chinese characteristics. So what might there be more specifically on the political side? Uh, the rule of one party, which is the Chinese Communist Party, which says it practices democratic centralism, uh, which leads to a particular uh, structural form of the party. As I think I've said before, in both in terms of economy and society, it leads to a preference for government and state over a private sector or the individual, um, that it sees um, some kind of collectivism as an important basis for um, policy and policy progress in China. With the socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, Tony, I assume is going to perhaps be the dominant uh, political economic ideology for China for um, quite a while longer. Let's, if we just peel off all the 
um, the rhetorics. Let's, if we just look at the essence of it, is it truly socialism? Well, it's certainly not socialism in generally any generally accepted uh, sense of the word in the West. There's no sort of socialist agenda uh, that one could unpack with that. I think what it means to the West is you have to take China at face value, what it's saying and what it does, and not pretend that China is something you want it to be. And I think that's been a major problem for the West, really ever since it started re-engaging in the 80s and through into the 90s. I think there is the China fantasy that somehow if China is more engaged in the world, it's going to become more like us. And uh, I just don't think that's true. Uh, I don't think that's shown to be the case. Maybe parts of it, maybe some people in it. But um, I think, uh, you know, China is not going to change just because the West says it should, or that President Biden begins to put together coalitions with other countries to try and pressure China to change. I think the Chinese leadership feels that the model it is operating is has been extremely successful mm -hmm. and has no intention to move away from it unless it becomes detrimental to China's own progress. Mm -hmm. And there are possibilities that that might happen, mm -hmm. but it's not really going to come from Western pressure. And so I think the you know, Western countries have to accept that you know, this is what China is, and from that basis you have to think of ways that you want to deal with it. Mm. And President Xi Jinping recently realized that China has gotten a communications problem, particularly post the outbreak of COVID-19. But I think personally, it is actually a deeper level issue than just simply a communications problem, because China has to frame this uh, trichotomy, essentially, of uh, uh, authoritarianism, Marxism, and Confucianism all within this uh, philosophical framework and try to explain that cultural complex to the West. Do you think China's gotten the narrative at the moment? Well, it's got a narrative that appeals to itself. I mean, and that ultimately is the most important. I mean, I think this recent Politburo meeting where it was talking about you know, that was interpreted in the West as a, as a softer, gentler China is nonsense. I mean, I think it was just we have to shape the message more effectively, but we're not going to change what we're doing. Uh, I don't see any indication uh, of that. And I think for Xi Jinping, it is, it's impossible to pull back. Um, you know, given that the wolf warrior diplomacy has been unleashed, he could only open himself up to criticism uh, from the nationalist netizens if they were to pull back from some of that, which is not very favorable uh, for him in that sense. And I think, you know, the Chinese leadership have got themselves into a position that is very difficult to back away from. Um, so, yes, they have explained uh, what now more clearly where they think they're going, what they think they want to be. And what they're realizing is not every part of the world, but much of the Western world is rejecting that vision. Um, and they don't really have an effective way to deal with that. Um, you know, other than hoping that they keep enough other countries on board through hard investments, through trade, through the Belt and Road Initiative and so forth. Um, and that that might make them more attracted uh, by a Chinese approach and a Chinese model and to get ahead in uh, new technologies so that uh, much of the developing world especially becomes dependent on Chinese technologies rather than those from the West to uh, enhance its uh, capabilities and power. It certainly I don't think has soft power that is often talked about. I mean, it's got panda bears, but uh, that's about it, I guess. And chopsticks. <laughs> Chopsticks, yeah, well, yeah. The U.S.-China relations. I think at the moment in the West, um, it's really got to work out how to deal with China. I mean, we hear these broad phrases, compete in some areas, maybe conflict in others, maybe cooperate in others. But that's not really the basis for an effective policy. And 
you know, I think two things are realistic. Uh, going back to what I said before, China is a reality. It's not going away. It's not going to change its domestic behaviors. It might make its external behaviors look better, but I don't think they're fundamentally going to change. The economics of that might change it if there's not effective Belt and Road investments. What do you think the Biden administration should do? Well, that's the first point. I think it has to recognize that uh, that reality is there. And while it's good to criticize its human rights practices, it's very unlikely to change any of that. I think the problem for the Biden administration currently is that it wants to restore what it sees as more of an alliance to resist uh, Chinese practices, whether this is this idea of the new investments in infrastructure, whether it's the COVID vaccine plan, or whether it's trying to get a coordinated response uh, to Chinese business practices. There, I think his problem is twofold. One is, I think allies are still not certain. What if Trump wins again in 2024? You know, do we want to bet everything now on a new um, or, or revived American interest? I think people are hedging bets. And that's related to the second challenge, which I think is broader than just the European Union. And it also impacts on US business and engagement, and certainly through Southeast Asia. That most countries do not want to be forced to, um, to make a choice between a US system or a China system. You know, uh, China trades with its uh, importance in the relationship is probably more important in twice as many countries as, as the US. So that's, that's also constraints about what a Biden administration can do because many countries are going to be resistant to the idea of being pushed into a clear anti-China camp. So I think some of the things we saw coming out of G7 are probably going to, to guide it. That, uh, yes, criticize China on human rights issues, but recognize that there has to be cooperation uh, if one wants to meet uh, overall uh, global objectives and goals. And I think John Kerry made that very clear when he was in Shanghai meeting with Xi Jinping, where somewhat contrary to what at the time the Biden administration was saying, he'd said the climate change was so important that all other issues should be set aside in terms of negotiations when dealing with that. And that's going to be the, the challenge for the administration. Can it you know, demarcate clearly uh, those areas uh, where cooperation uh, would be important? And I think we're seeing an interesting shift that in the past, America always used to say, no, we're not going to deal with these issues one by one, separate mm -hmm. them out. It's a comprehensive question. Now America is more or less saying, let's snip it up. Let's deal with these things separately. And China seems to be saying, no, it's a whole package. You either deal with the whole package or it's a problem. So it's a very <laughs> significant switch uh, in attitudes. Tony, you've written 100 years of Chinese history. One last question for you. Do you see a future global order that is governed by the Chinese Communist Party? No, I don't. <laughs> I mean, I do see a future global order which is going to be significantly impacted by the Chinese government. Because also remember, there are parts of the, of the global order that China likes and has done well out of. I mean, it strongly defends the UN Charter. It is uh, done very well out of trading arrangements and organizations. But there are clearly other parts around the human rights regime in Geneva that it is opposed to. I think it wants to get a strong role in internet governance. And that's why I think in areas of what I refer to as new global public goods, there there has to be a partnership. And it might be possible to shape some of those rules and norms together with China. And I think, you know, we have to accept that some countries are attracted to a Chinese global order as much as they are to an American global order. Mm. So I don't think any one country is going to dominate moving forward. You know, the, the post Second World War era has gone. It's not going to come back. China will dominate in some areas, the West in others. 
and there might be a compromise around other key questions. Mm. Harvard professor Tony Seish from Rebel to Ruler coming onto the market on July 1st. Uh, check it out and uh, enjoy the fascinating read. Thank you Thanks. so much, Tony. Thanks, Shirley.